Hi, I'm Peter Capaldi. I play the Doctor, and you're watching EMS Productions. Hello everybody and welcome on to today's video where today I'm going to be continuing my look back over each series of Moffat era with series 8, the beginning of the Peter Capaldi era. So yes, after we come off the back of the 50th anniversary special, the departure of Matt Smith as the 11th Doctor, we head into series 8 where we get Peter Capaldi as the Doctor for the very first time. Um, he was certainly a sort of, I guess, a fairly interesting casting choice back when it was announced in 2013 because he was the first properly old Doctor of New Who and that was, I think, a little bit sort of debated as to whether it was going to put people off or this kind of thing. And, well, I think when you look through this, his era, there are some signs of that, but I'll get into that over the next two or three videos. For me personally, this is certainly my probably my favourite era of the show, so, so I'm generally going to be sort of airing some pretty positive views about the series, but I certainly will acknowledge where the show struggled over the last, over these three series to come. With this series, Doctor Who moved back to the autumn slot for the first time in a very long time, other than five episodes in 2012. And it was the first time since 2011 that we actually had a full 12 or 13 episode series um, in the same year, which was quite nice after many years of, two years of messy and horrible scheduling, as you would have seen in my last video if you'd watch that. So we begin with Deep Breath, Peter Capaldi's introductory story, his first story, of an extended length story of 75 minutes. And for me personally, this is still um, a very, very much a favourite of mine. I really enjoy Peter Capaldi's introduction story. I think he has some absolutely brilliant scenes when he's trying to under, sort of understand himself early on. He's all a little bit crazy and out of it. And I think the sort of extended running time just gives the story a bit more time to breathe and develop and really give kind of the Doctor and Clara in a lot of it, lots of really good sort of lengthy scenes to be able to kind of really understand the Twelfth Doctor a bit more and find just start to find out a bit about him. So I thought that was a really strong part of this episode. This is probably the start of a much stronger patch for Clara Oswald as a character in Doctor Who and certainly it was very interesting to see this sort of dynamic of her trying to understand who this new Doctor really is and not particularly really liking what she's finding to a large degree because he's not young, good looking, easy to get on with kind of thing. He's a bit, he's old, he's a bit abrasive, not always really very nice. And so it's sort of a, it was just a very interesting sort of dynamic that we hadn't really seen, certainly in New Who since it'd come back, seeing a companion that didn't really get on with the Doctor when he first sort of um, regenerated and turned up. And then there's that brilliant scene when they're um, under the, under underneath the restaurant with the um, with the clockwork droid. I can't remember his name. Um, or the half faced man, that was what he was apparently called. Um, when when Peter Capaldi obviously first appears, and it really feels like he's the Doctor. Um, as he rip, as he does appear when Clara needs him most, and he rips off that um, Matt Smith mask, as you do, um, and then goes and saves the day, obviously, as you would. That that sort of scene just sort of really feels like P.G. Pounder is the Doctor for the very first time. And then we have that really nice sort of scene towards the end of the episode where we see Matt Smith's Doctor pop up again just to have a little sort of phone call, a little chat with Clara. And I remember at the time it was a very kind of a mixed reaction. Obviously there were loads of, oh, it's Matt Smith, this is the most amazing thing ever. And there was also the sense of it was kind of undermining Peter Capaldi's Doctor by having Matt Smith turn up at the end of the episode again. But personally, I think that that works really well in the context of the story because it feels like Clara really needs that sort of push from 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 the Doctor, from her her Doctor, as she feels, to really get her to sort of understand and really get on with the Twelfth Doctor. And so I thought that it was just a really nice scene. Obviously it was nice to see Matt Smith again, but I think it did work very well within the context of the story. And then that final scene of the episode, of course, set off all the mystery and the intrigue of who was this mysterious woman called Missy, who's hiding in some nether sphere, the end of, or outside of the world universe after people die. What on earth is all of that? So, and of course we find out eventually, and it was kind of the number one choice that was going to be the master, I think, pretty much straight away. It was quite nice to have a sort of um, arc of who, who is this woman, what's going on, and then having her feature through the series. I don't think it was the strongest arc overall, which I'll come to a little bit later on. And it was a little bit frustrating that it was yet another who is this mystery woman after we had Clara in series 7B, we had River early on in like series 5 and series 6, then we have Shilda in series 9. It just feels like we keep on having this mystery woman turn up, which isn't the greatest. And so overall I would certainly say Deep Breath is a very strong introduction to the Twelfth Doctor, probably not quite as strong as the Eleventh Hour, which was just a kind of a complete fresh take on the show and works so brilliantly, but certainly I think it's very much up there and probably ahead of certainly Rose and um, definitely New Earth. So then on to the next episode we get into the Dalek, which naturally by the title features the Doctor and Clara going into a Dalek. And this one is another, it feels like a sort of solid episode. Nothing particularly spectacular, it's a fairly interesting sort of idea to explore, seeing what the inside of a Dalek is like, how it works and everything like that. And certainly the CGI and the visuals were absolutely phenomenal from this episode, really, really impressive. 
look inside the Dalek. And obviously to a large degree it was kind of set up to kind of show the Twelfth Doctor his dark side and bringing up that question of am I a good man which leads through the series. This very much sort of when he's faced against a Dalek, um, this sort of Dalek that sees into his soul seeing beauty, divinity and hatred. Um, it's it's kind of to a large degree feels like it's set up for that. I mean Peter has a few good lines, the one um, the one and with Clara early wrong where he says um, she cares so I don't have to, which is just a brilliant little line. And it is a good episode overall, it's nice to actually see some Daleks kill some people for once, which didn't happen for about four years, I think, since about 2000, or even six, I'm fairly sure it's like 2008, the last time we saw a massive Dalek killing. Um, so it had been a while, and that was nice, but other than that, there wasn't really a huge amount going on in this episode. But it did, of course, introduce Mr. Danny Pink. Now, unfortunately, Danny Pink is the misstep of Series 8, massively. It really doesn't work. I'll get through it a little bit more as we go through this video, but early on it's 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 okay it feels a little bit shoehorned in we randomly see clara at the school and then this other bloke turns up who suddenly falls in love with clara what a surprise um that's yeah i'll get into that following that there's another very kind of just averagely good episode robot of sherwood which is entertaining but feels like it's written for matt smith completely feels like it's written for matt smith it's just such a sort of um change in direction from the first two episodes which have been a bit dark and serious and then suddenly it's the Doctor playing comedy for 45 minutes with Robin Hood. It just, it, it's completely out of place within the series. I think if you're going to do it, you have to at least do it a bit later down the line. Or to be honest, it wasn't just, really wasn't a script that fitted, certainly the Series 8 12th Doctor. I think maybe in Series 9, that would have fitted a bit better when he did take on that slightly more comedic approach, but in Series 8, it just doesn't fit. And I don't really have anything more about to say about it, it's just, yes, another average Mark Gator story. Um, yeah, there's nothing to say. But following that, we have the absolutely phenomenal episode that is Listen. That is, it's always an exciting prospect when Stephen Moffat is going to write a standalone episode. Certainly that was the one being talked about early on. I mean, unfortunately it was the one that was talked about after it all got leaked. As you may remember, back to sort of July 2014, I think, June, July, when suddenly the scripts and then the actual footage of the first five episodes of Doctor Who managed to leak online. Good job to, I think it was Marcelo Camargo or something like that was his name of some South American bloke who'd managed to accidentally lose all the files and leak them online. So that was a really good start to the um, Peter Capaldi era that anybody could just go online and find the first five scripts and the first five actual episodes, which wasn't great. But anyway, coming back to Listen, what a story that was. It was, it's such a sort of interesting idea for the um, Doctor. Well, it's, it's, one, it's a very much feels like a sort of concept the Doctor would think about. Um, a creature that lives to hide, that we'll never be able to see it because it's, it's, it always hides whenever we're looking. So it could be there all the time and we don't even realise that creature on the bed that's coming to sort of attack us but we can never see it because it's always hiding from us. That is a fantastic little concept there for to explore in Doctor Who, I really think it is. And Stephen Moffat does a brilliant job of exploring that concept through this episode, obviously then linking in the whole Danny Pink stuff as well with the disastrous date. That's it, It's working okay, the Duck Clara Danny dynamic at this point. It's a little bit frustrating at times and it's a little bit like, do we really need any more of this? But it kind of does need to be put into the context of the story, obviously, when they go and see Rupert Pink back when he's um, a little kid. And so with some really interesting concepts, we also have a fantastic ending to this story, with the, the, the Clara obviously ending up on Gallifrey at the very end without even realising, and meeting the Doctor as a child. I had, unfortunately, I remember I had, I had been spoiled of this going into the episode because of the leaked episodes. I hadn't gone and looked at the leaked episodes, I'd just seen someone, I think, post a comment on Reddit or on YouTube or something like that, that said the Doctor will meet, meet, will meet a young version of the first Doctor in this story. Which was, so it was a little bit annoying that it's kind of like, as soon as they, they, the TARDIS turns up there, we see a kid on the bed, I'm like, yeah, that's the first, that's, that's the young first Doctor, yeah, it is, it is. So that was a little bit annoying, but it was still a brilliant scene, an absolutely phenomenal scene, linking obviously back into the barn from the day of the Doctor, so you can have a little reference to the War Doctor in there, and kind of setting up why the Doctor's, sort of, um, the Doctor's talk about being um, cruel or cowardly, and all that little sort of stuff that Clara says that the Doctor's already said, so who, it's a good old paradox that who said it originally. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a lovely little scene, brilliant music on there, just sort of fi finishing off this fantastic episode. Then we have yet another average episode in Time Heist, which is robbing a bank. It's quite entertaining, it's solid, it's nothing special. It's a good, yeah, it's a good bit of sort of TARDIS crew style with a few extra people in sort of being brought in. And then a nice little sort of twist at the end that actually the aliens aren't really evil, they just want to be in love. Because we love a storyline like that. 
Um, other, yeah, there's nothing more to say. Then the caretakers, where it all goes a bit com comedy again. With um, it's basically a rom-com of a story. Um, this one with obviously the doctor and um, doctor and Clara and Danny turning up. They they will end up back at Coal Hill School, and we kind of. Clara just is being a bit of an idiot, trying to control everything, because she is a control freak, as we know, that she tries to control the Doctor and Danny and still explain it away, even though that's completely impossible. And it's it's a nice one where the Danny's trying to prove himself to the Doctor, but this is also where I feel some of the missteps, personally for me, kind of start to manifest themselves. When you have those scenes with um, Danny and the Doctor in the TARDIS, where he's basically sort of going, oh, I'm a, I'm a soldier, I should salute you because you're the general, uh, being very sort of angry with him and everything and it's like yes it's good to have a bit of conflict between characters but he's essentially a character that we're meant to start liking at the end of the series and feel for and yet at this stage I think naturally your position is generally to favour the Doctor and sort of um, feel for the Doctor and be negative towards people who don't have the Doctor and all that kind of thing as a fairly sort of normal reaction to the show um, so then to have a character that in episode 6 you're meant to you think it's, it's being all really nasty to the Doctor and you don't want to like him by episode 12, you're meant to feel sympathy for him. It's just not a very well-crafted arc, as far as I'm concerned. Now, following that, we have Kill the Moon, which is a very interesting episode, shall we say. Obviously, we have the moon is an egg, we have the Doctor leaving for no reason, and just being a bit of an idiot. And it's all just not particularly great, because I remember the hype pre-episode for this episode. I remember back to 2014, there was a lot of comments about the Doctor's going to do something he's never done before, that you've never seen him do before. It's going to be high drama. Then all the rating, all the reviews are giving it 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10. This is one of the best episodes of the show history. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's spooky. It's scary. It's brilliant. It's just like... And then we all saw it. And it really wasn't. Most Peter Capaldi episodes I will defend. I will defend hard because I really like Peter Capaldi as the Doctor. And I think a lot of his stories are very underrated. But the Kill the Moon just feels like such a misstep. It just feels like it really went wrong for an episode. The Doctor doesn't just run away and leave it up to the humans to, to, to deal with things. That's just not what happens. He doesn't do that. That's the point. And he was, he's sort of being so patronising to them um, um, that you can make all the decisions, you solve it all, it's all up to you now, I can't do anything, and then he just wanders off. That just feels so undoctorly like I know it's a new incarnation of the Doctor. He's a bit more darker, a bit more sort of un unpredictable, but this just felt like a step too far and really I don't feel worked well as a story within this series. And obviously there's the Moon is the Egg idea, which also is not the greatest either. It's just a bit... I know we, we it's science fiction, but it's like, that just feels a little bit too far into sort of fiction, fantasy, unrealistic, unbelievable kind of idea for me to really sort of um, comprehend and be happy with. But after that disappointment, we have two absolutely fantastic episodes from Jamie Mathieson um, for the next two episodes of the series with, with uh, Mummy and the Orange Express and Flatline, which I think are probably the two best episodes of the series for me. I always remember watching Mummy and the Orange Express and just thinking, it's absolutely brilliant, I love this story. Um, it's just that sort of brilliant kind of, um, they're on this mystery train, a detective story trying to figure out the mystery, what's going on, whilst people are dying to try and find stuff out and everything. It's such a brilliantly crafted idea with the plot, you have Gus, Gus in there as well as that mysterious voice that was going to at some point be brought back, I believe, but never actually happened. Um, and I, yeah, I just really enjoy the story. Frank Skinner is, um, whatever his name is, the, the um, I can't even remember. Um, but he's brilliant in the story as well, as kind of the Doctor's sort of sort of companion for parts of the story, um, when it's supposedly the Doctor and Clara's last hurrah, which th that's the only bit where it sort of struggles with this mid-series bit, is the Doctor and Clara's sort of back and forth relationship, where they go from Kill the Moon where that's it, it's all over, to then the start of Mummy's Mummy Oliver Express is also it's all over. By the end of the episode, they're all back together happy days again. It's just a bit too sort of quick back and forth and a bit not needed really. And then Flatline's another brilliant one where obviously it's meant to be a bit more of a Doctor light story with Clara Oswald basically taking on the role of the Doctor for this episode. It's a very interesting concept with these sort of creatures in the walls that come out of the walls to kill people or pull people into the walls and that kind of thing. How do you defeat sort of someone who's not in the third dimension? Um, it's, very, it's a very interesting concept and obviously with the Doctor saving the day at the end as well. It's, I think that's what's great about some of these Jamie Matthews and episodes is just they have such a great concept behind them which are then pulled off very well rather than maybe either a good concept that's a disaster or just a bad idea in the start in the first place. Which unfortunately can be said of In the Forest of the Night, which is the other episode of this series that I won't even bother trying to defend. It is terrible. That is literally just it. It looks nice, 
The visuals are very nice, I'll give it that, um, but that is about it for it. The plot wise, it's terrific. The solution, oh, they just happen to be a, a um, whatever it's called, I can't even remember, I'm, my, my words are done by this point, so I just don't care about this episode. Um, it's it's just very bad. The, the acting, obviously loads of child actors doesn't work at all, it's pretty poor. And there's just really nothing good to say about it. So let's move on to the finale then, shall we? Um, when we're finally going to find out who Missy is, what's going on with the Cybermen, who we unfortunately knew were coming before this series because they decided to. Well, the problem was they filmed on the streets of London, so it's going to be quite hard to keep that a secret, so they just had to publish it anyway. And then obviously that is a big part of the finale. By this point, um, we've seen lots of little cameo appearances from Missy. This is where I wanted to address the kind of disappointment of the arc in some, some, in some ways. It just feels... It's not really a sort of story arc going through the series. It's just a, a few scenes stuck on the end of episodes to try and make a mi continue a mystery through the series. It's not really embedded within the plot of each of the episodes. It's just a little scene tagged on the end to say, look, here's another mystery comment from Missy, or look, keep remembering that she's the mysterious woman that's gonna turn up at the end of the series. Um, so that, I feel, doesn't work fantastically. But then this finale is a very interesting one. We obviously have um, Danny Pink being killed at the very beginning of the episode, and that sets up this whole um, concept of finding out what's off, find, going to find Danny in the afterlife, what happens when you die, and all this kind of thing. Then the don't, cre don't cremate me for the 3W organisation. It's all pretty dark and grim, and I remember there were a lot of complaints from um, grumpy old parents, I'm guessing, who were like, oh, this is too dark for Doctor Who at 7 o'clock on a Saturday evening. Well, no, it's not really. It's just slightly, slightly darker Doctor Who, but it's not too bad for kids. You can tell them not to watch rather than make complaints about it. So I thought that was a bit much. But certainly it was a fairly dark and horrible concept that after you die, you're still going to feel the pain of being cremated in the afterlife, wherever that may be. Um, it's, yeah, a pretty dark and horrible concept, really. But it's the sort of thing that Stephen Moffat was going to explore at some point, you have to say. And he does do a very good job of it, of kind of making it almost like a sort of an office-style um, afterlife, certainly with um, Seb played by Chris Addison. That, he's, he's such a brilliant character in Dark Water. He's really got some fantastic lines between him and Danny. They sort of play off, the, well he plays off him really well and has just some brilliant comedy lines to kind of lighten the atmosphere a little bit when it's all a bit dark and gloomy. Obviously this is the um, Missy reveal. Thankfully for me at the time I did not know that Missy was going to be the master. Well, it hadn't been spoiled. Of course I could have predicted it, but when I when it was actually announced, when it was actually that scene is the reveal happens, it was it was a pretty exciting moment, I think, for pretty much everybody. It was, although it was a little bit sort of, oh, she's a woman now, I think it was still fairly exciting and shocking and like, wow, this has actually happened. Because even up until that point, you're never quite sure it's going to be the master, even if you think that's the most likely outcome. So, and it was such a brilliant scene as well when Miss Easter reveals it right at the end of the episode, that is the cliffhanger that she is the master and the Doctor looking on in utter sort of shock and disgust at it. It's, it's just such a brilliant moment, I think. One of the highlights of the series is that sort of scene. And at the same time, we also have all the Cybermen coming out of St Paul's Cathedral to take over London and take over the world and all this kind of thing. And it's all going quite badly. Obviously, there's the nice continuity reference of the Cybermen in front of St Paul's Cathedral from the invasion in 1968, um, which is a nice moment as well. And this first part is just overall a really sort of an, an interesting kind of... Um, Finding, trying to find out the mystery, find out exactly what's going on. There's also the brilliant scene with the Doctor and Clara when they're on the volcano or not um, when it seems that Clara is kind of throwing away everything for the doc for the of the TARDIS for the Doctor for everything just to try and save Danny and be back with Danny and it's a, it's a brilliantly acted scene and obviously finding out that actually it was all in the Doctor's control despite Clara thinking it's all in her control that's a brilliant moment and then one of my sort of favorite I think most iconic Doctor lines um, or 12th Doctor lines is that moment when um, he says, do you think I care for you so little that betraying me would make a difference? It's just such a sort of um, a brilliant line that no matter what Clara does, how sort of much she's betrayed him, he still forgives her. And I think that's a sort of a nice, almost a way to live up to as well, that, that idea of kind of um, forgiving no matter what. And that's sort of something that really the Doctor is standing there for, that he will forgive. So yes, the first part's phenomenal. Going on to episode t the second part, Death in Heaven, it's not quite as strong, I'll be honest. I don't think it's quite as great. Um, I mean, this episode is a lot more sort of about the characters, I think, whereas there was a bit more plot going on in the first part. We kind of end up with a lot more sort of longer scenes, a lot of kind of um, relationship between characters and scenes, the dynamic between the different characters and all this kind of thing. For it, as we obviously end up with Danny being a Cyberman, which, which unfortunately I knew pre-series as well, because I'd seen some tweets about it and leaks and stuff. 
So that was a bit of a disappointment, that going into the series I knew that Danny Pink was going to become a sideman in episode 12. That wasn't great, but there we go. And this is really where the kind of Danny Pink storyline finally falls apart. I mentioned about it earlier, it's just, he's a Cyberman, we're meant to feel sorry for him about this, but we've had no reason so far to feel sorry about him for this because he's just been annoyed at the Doctor and kind of interfering with the Doctor and Clara, which is obviously naturally as an audience not what we really want. So unless you've massively taken a light to Danny Pink, which I don't think many people did, it's not what it's not sort of going to work as an episode because you're just not going to feel sorry for him. I mean it kind of works with the arc with the Doctor obviously about him being a good man and him the whole I need to know thing no matter what he is being that he is being that army general and does need to know what's going on and what's going to happen even if it does mean the death of Danny Pink essentially. Um, so that's a nice moment and obviously leading to kind of the Doctor's revelation about is he a good man, bad man, no he's an idiot, all this sort of thing. It's, it's quite a nice little scene that he's kind of feels a sort of um at peace with who he is now, I think he really understands who he is by the end of the series, which always was kind of the main arc of the series with the Doctor trying to, trying to understand this new incarnation because it was a very different change from what we'd seen with certainly um, Matt Smith and David Tennant where they were just the Doctor by the end of the episode, no problem, there wasn't any issue there, whereas for the Twelfth Doctor it was a bit more of a shock, I think, maybe it's because it was the first of a new cycle, it took him a little bit longer to really understand himself, who he was, because he's such a big change from the previous Doctors. So that was, that was one of the stronger, I think, better arcs of the series about the am I a good man and trying to understand who he really is. And also in this finale we have the sort of relationship between the Doctor and Clara, which has been a very, is an, is an interesting one through Series 8. It's obviously a bit more up and down than maybe in Series 7 and certainly in Series 9, um, between the two of them where she's not so sure early on, then they get okay, then they completely fall out, and then they come, come back together. And it's, it's almost like they are a kind of partner, a, a sort of couple kind of thing, which is kind of what it's built to be by Series 9, I would say. Um, but there is an interesting dynamic there, and obviously it's it's kind of... I've always found it's been a, it's a slightly odd ending to, die, de to Death in Heaven. Of course, at the time we didn't know whether this would be um, Clara's last appearance. I'm, I'm fairly sure we knew that she was in Last Christmas. I can't remember 100%, but I think we did. Um, and But we didn't know whether she'd be staying past Last Christmas at this stage. And for that, for this last scene of Death in Heaven, it just sort of felt a bit kind of an odd, an almost an odd ending. It sort of felt a little bit left open, because usually character depart, companion departures are big dramatic affairs with deaths or massive emotional music and sadness and crying and everything. Um, whereas with this one, it's just kind of a sort of um, a nice little couple of lines between the Twelfth Doctor and Clara about feeling special, and then she just kind of walks off. And that's it. And it, it, it always just has felt a little bit odd to me. And obviously then you have this little cameo from um, Santa Claus saying it can't end like that, which it can't. But I've just always kind of, yeah, not really liked that ending massively as it's just felt a bit sort of, yeah, an odd, an odd ending, I think. So you reach the end of this series, but I also want to call, talk about Last Christmas as well, as it's very much linked to Series 8 rather than Series 9. It, and it only aired about a month after the end of Series 8 as well, so it very much sort of feels like the kind of almost the... Um, epilogue of Series 8, the ending, kind of a final a final end of Series 8 to a large degree. And this, I think, is probably one of my favourite Christmas specials. I really enjoy this. Um, it's a base under siege story with these um, dream crabs. Obviously it brings in a bit a bit of kind of Inception style dreams within dreams or Amy's Choice episode as well um, with the whole, yeah, dream within dream concept and dying in dreams and everything, which is always something I really like because I love Inception as a film as well. And so whenever you bring concepts like that into Doctor Who, I really enjoy it, and that's I think one of the very strong parts of this story is it's got a good concept behind it. Obviously we do see Danny Pink one more time, um, kind of saving Clara again from dying in a dream, uh, which is quite nice, And but then it's nice to just finally kind of finish his story, have rid of him to a large degree, and we don't see him again in Doctor Who. Um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of strong points about this episode, but obviously the key point is the ending of this story, where it does really genuinely seem like this is the end of Clara Oswald's, and at the time we we really didn't know. No one actually knew whether she was going to be in Series 9 or not because it hadn't started filming. There, obviously there were the natural tabloid rumours and stuff about it, but there was nothing, no leaks, nothing at all that we could actually sort of quantifiably say. So I'm Janet sat, we're sat there genuinely watching it thinking, is this the end of Clara Oswald or is there one more miracle um, that's going to come and save her, as obviously it is. And Personally, I was pleased about that because I really like Clara Oswald as a companion. I know for some people it feels like that should have been her ending, and I, it would it would have been a very good ending for um, her story that she kind of ended up losing the rest of her life because she kind of stayed too long, she travelled too far with that kind of thing that she was almost punished for it and had to become old and live an old life just stuck on Earth. She'd travelled a lot, but she'd never really been happy 
I think you would say. Um, so it was a very kind of, it, was, it looked like it was going to be such a sad ending, it was a perfect kind of, um, I always remember that scene with the Doctor and Clara pulling the cracker, which kind of um, reflects back to Time of the Doctor when it was the other way round with um, Clara helping the Doctor to do it and then this time around it's the Doctor helping Clara to do it. That was just a sort of brilliant sort of comparison um, idea there and it did all, it did really did feel like this is the end. That is it. It's the end of Clara Oswald. But then Santa Claus appears and it's all good. And it sets them off on lots of new adventures for Series 9 where um, I think it, obviously the Doctor and Clara relationship is sort of solidified that she's cutting her ties to Earth and it's all all go from here. Obviously I'll, I'll address that all in Series 9 and my Series 9 video as to exactly what's going on there and everything. But other than that, and that is pretty much the end of Series 8, which I think is probably the weakest series of the three for Peter Capaldi. I would say it's probably a, of the five Moffat era series, or six, yeah, six even, um, I would probably put it behind Series 9 and Series 5 and probably Series 10. Um, but I'd put it ahead of Series 6 and 7, certainly, um, as a series. It's, I think it's always always the way it has been with, with some of these series, that when you don't have any two-parters, it sometimes does feel a little bit like we just have too many sort of average and unimportant episodes in a series. Obviously, the, with this, we start this series with ten single-part stories, um, which I just I just don't really like. I always prefer having a couple of two-parters in there just to kind of have a few more significant, longer stories in it. And that's obviously something lacking from Series 8, from Series 7, from Series 10. Uh, well, it's a bit different with Series 10. I do really like Peter Paldi in this series as the Doctor. He's obviously is a bit of a darker Doctor to what we've seen before, a bit more serious, a bit more unpredictable. Um, I think you'd have to say it probably did put some of the audience off looking at the figures more through the next couple of series than this series, but certainly it had dropped a little bit for Series 8 and then going on as well. Right then, I've been waffling on for ages now, so let's wrap this video up. Um, I really like Series 8, not the best, but it's a very good Peter Paldi series. Do let me go know guys in the comments below what are your favourite episodes of Series 8. Probably for me, it's pretty deep breath. Mummy and the Nautic Express and Flatline, with the finale being close behind as well, and listen right there as well. Um, but other than that, thank you very much for watching the video, guys. Remember to like it, subscribe if you're new here, and I'll see you again very, very soon for another video. Goodbye.